Good evening. My name is Barbara Gold. It's a pleasure to be here at the NEF meeting. I was involved in this organization for a couple of years, about five years ago. I went away and now I've been invited to come back and it's really great to be here. I want to thank my good friend Stefan Sisko for throwing my name into the hat for being a speaker this evening and for uh, David Moss, the president of NEF, for following up on that and inviting me to give this brief presentation this evening, just 20 minutes on how to own the stage when you're an entrepreneur. We're going to focus this evening on delivery skills um, and that's one of my expertises. I've been an executive communication skills coach for many years and I just love helping people become effective in their presentations. So we're going to get started with something that I consider very fundamental to the whole conversation about presenting well and that is posture. It all starts with how you use your body and how you control your body's movement as well. I like to suggest that people keep their lower body very still. We want to minimize what I call random movement. Random movement in front of a room, be it with your legs or with your hands or arms, is very distracting. But if you can make that movement intentional, you can actually attract the attention of your audience. So we start with what I call relaxed military posture. We want our feet about as wide as our hips. We want our weight equally balanced. I am not a fan of hip jumps. <laughs> that they, it generally looks a little casual for whatever occasion you're presenting for. And it also has the effect of causing head tilt which also doesn't look so professional. So I do counsel people to keep their lower body still, keep their legs under their feet and legs under their hips. That stabilizes you. You want to minimize any tendency to rock, to wander on your feet. All of that is what I would term distracting movement. That doesn't mean you have to stay rooted to one spot, which can seem a little weird. Um, most people are like, so I can't move at all? Oh, no, you can move, <clears throat> but you want to look like you mean to move. That's really the key thing. You want to look like you intend to go wherever you go. So, for example, if I'm standing here and I want to move there, I just very calmly step over or walk over. I spend a minute here and then maybe I walk to another point on the stage. So it's all about controlling your movement and looking like you mean to be doing what you're doing as opposed to random movement which is usually you don't even know you're doing it so it's you're very distracted and you're distracting your audience as well we want to have our shoulders relaxed don't pull them back too tight like in the military <clears throat> uh, you want them a little bit forward so that your arms hang down in front of you and you want to have a straight spine. That straight spine is all about accessing your diaphragm. You want to be breathing from your diaphragm. So for sure, that standing straight will help you project your voice. It's not only, a, the posture is not only about standing still, it's also about how we use our voice. That's all I have for now about posture. We're going to get to how we use our hands and our arms in a couple of minutes. Next, let's move on to the ever important topic of eye contact. Eye contact is critical for building trust with your audience and also for helping them feel included. It's very important when you are in front of a room to make sure that you look at everyone. You don't want to leave anyone out. You don't want to leave any part of the room out. Of course, the best piece of advice is never give any audience your back. You want to always remain facing forward. But you also want, you want to be forward but looking at that whole room. The rule of thumb for eye contact is that you actually look at people in the eye in your audience. You make eye contact with various individuals in that audience just briefly. 
You glance, you catch their eye, you then move on and catch the eye of another person. This can be very intimidating to some people, but in fact it's the way you should be doing eye contact when you're in the front of a room. You want to, if there's a row of people, you don't necessarily want to go down the row and look at each person in sequence. You want to make it a little more random than that. And of course, there may be some people too far in the back of the room for you to actually meet their eye, but you want to make eye contact with as many people as you can, and you want to be inclusive of your entire room so that no one feels left out. Sometimes what can happen is, uh, in a few minutes, the contestants this evening are going to be asked questions by a panel of judges. There could be a tendency to turn toward the judges and only address your answer to that question to those people. But in fact, what you want to do is listen to the question, thank them for the question, and then address your answer to the whole room so that you're not leaving anyone out. That would be best practice for eye contact. Let's move on to gestures. Obviously our arms and our hands are part of our body, so this is included in the posture conversation, but I usually break it out because people are so frequently confused and concerned about what to do with their hands. It's one of the most common questions I get as a communications coach, what do I do with my hands? And people like will stick them in their pockets, no, no, behind the back, no, no. People wonder what you've got back there. You want to keep your hands visible, but the really key piece of advice is that you want to make your hands work for you. If you're not using your hands purposefully, you're wasting a resource. Your hands are there to help you reinforce your verbal message. That could be in the form of counting on your fingers. It could be on the form of drawing something. It could be on the, on the it, you could, indicate how large something is. It's okay to bring your hands out about this far briefly if you're indicating size, for example, but you don't want to have your arms and hands too far away from your body most of the time. That would be considered flailing or, or being overly uh, exuberant with your gestures. You want to keep them somewhat contained right around the middle of your body of course, there's a whole other technique if, in fact, you are presenting virtually. If you're presenting virtually, you've just got the little postage stamp. A couple of tips on how to have more space. You want to move your hands up into the frame of the picture on Zoom or whatever technology you're using. A couple of tips, you can tilt your camera so that there's very little space at the top of your head between the top of your head and the frame. Keep that tight and that will give you more space here in which to utilize your hands. And then bring them up in the frame and use them as best you can in that same intentional way so that you are reinforcing your verbal message. I think that's all I wanted to say about gestures. The key thing is, again, intention, firm, no flailing, we can say. We're now going to move on to aspects of voice, and there are actually, it's quite a broad topic. There are more things uh, related to your voice than you might think. The first one we already kind of mentioned when we talked about posture, and that is volume. One of the reasons we want to stand straight is so that we can breathe from our diaphragm down here and project that voice from a lower point in our body than just our throat. If we're projecting only from here, we can tend to shout or seem shrill. Also, we can get a sore throat. We can lose our voice quicker if we're only projecting from here. If we're projecting our voice from a deeper place, and this can take a bit of practice to feel it and really understand where your breath is coming from, but it gives you more longevity of voice, and it also allows you to reach all parts of the room without shouting. So that's the volume. The other good thing to know about volume is it's good to vary it. Get a little quiet, get a little louder, make a point more loudly, but then bring it back and become a little softer. All of this intrigues your listener. It keeps them with you. It helps them to find you interesting and to stay engaged with what you're saying. So but varying the volume of your voice is a technique to draw audience attention. 
A couple of other things to do with voice. Speed is one of them, how quickly we speak. If we speak too quickly, it generally gives people the impression that we're nervous and we want to get done. So we all need to find our pacing. I recommend that people find what I call a measured pace, which is the pace I should be speaking at this evening. Fast enough that you're going to get through your material, slow enough so that people are going to retain what you say. If you speak too quickly, retention goes down. So it's not only the fact that you give the impression that you're nervous, it's also that you impact how much your listener will retain of what you say. So speaking at a measured pace is something you can learn to do. Record yourself, listen back, have other people listen as well, because your own impression of how quickly you're speaking may be different than, than the impression of other people. Pitching is especially prone to people speeding up because they know they have a limited amount of time. So don't fall into that trap. Put in less content and speak more slowly and you'll make a better impression. A couple of other things that have to do with voice are related to intonation patterns. You want to make sure that you are stressing the key words in the sentence, words that you want that audience to twig on and to retain. You also want to make sure that you have interest in your voice. Sometimes people try to use notes or they read from a slide. People know when you're reading, the intonation changes and you sound pretty flat. So practice your pitch or your presentation enough times that you can recite, not recite it, but say it um, accurately enough, it doesn't have to be perfect, but accurately enough, and sound relaxed. Sound like your natural self is where you want to go with that. Another thing regarding intonation is the up speak that we can hear sometimes. You may hear it on the radio, you may hear it from people that you speak with. It's going up at the end of the phrase. My name is Barbara Bolt, my company is Bolt Global, I'm an executive communication skills coach. All of that sounds quite tentative because I'm not nailing the end of my phrase. English is a language that's constructed of short, concise phrases with a full stop at the end. And that full stop indicates that you want to take your voice down. You will sound more powerful and you will sound more confident. So make sure that you are taking that voice down, particularly in moments when you're speaking about something super important like money. You don't want to sound tentative when you're asking an investor group for hundreds of thousands of dollars. I'd like $500,000, they're not gonna buy that. So I will, I'm asking today for $500,000 down at the end of that phrase. That's pretty much all I wanted to say about voice. We'll move on now to repetitive sounds and words. These are, I'm sure everybody's thinking, oh, it's the um. You're right, it's the um. You have to become aware of whether or not you are an ummer. Most of the time, people who um in a presentation also um when they're just in conversation. So I often pick up that somebody's an ummer by just speaking with them. Umming is one of those very distracting, very annoying noises that presenters make. It drives me insane, I'm hypersensitive, but it does detract from the message you're trying to convey. So it's a good thing to become aware of and then get it out of your usage. And the way that you can do that, become aware by speaking and having somebody snap their fingers or make a loud noise every time you do it. That's very effective because you'll be like, oh my gosh, I have no idea I was umming or eyeing that frequently. Once you become aware or your brain starts to twig on it, initially your brain will catch it after it happens. You'll be like, oh, I ummed, oh, darn. However, eventually your brain will stop you before you um or ah. And in that case, what you substitute it with is silence. You simply pause. Often umming and eyeing are because you're having to think of what you want to say next. 
the idea is to just think silently. Don't open your mouth, don't make a sound. Other words that can become repetitive and thus annoying are words like so at the beginning of every phrase. So is a fine word. However, it's not appropriate at the beginning of every phrase. And, and is a word that can be heavily overused. I have coached people who start every sentence with and. Effectively, they are connecting every sentence in their presentation and nothing is popping. Nothing is sticking out. The brains of those of us who are speakers of English listen for subject, verb, object. I am doing, we are going, we are launching. Our brain is looking for the subject. If we start every sentence with but or and, our brain doesn't hear that. It doesn't find the subject. So it really reduces the impact of what you're saying. Other repetitive words and phrases can be like, right, you know, I really dislike you know because they don't know, you're telling them, otherwise they wouldn't be there. So if you find that you're a person or you know that you're a person who has the you know bug, weed that out the same way. You weed all of those things out of your usage in the same way. You become aware, your brain catches on, and eventually it will stop you before you use those annoying little words. Another group of words that I like to bring to people's attention are what I call minimizer words. They are words like kind of, sort of, maybe, a little bit. We sometimes unconsciously use these words and again we detract from the power of our verbal message. It makes us sound tentative, it makes us sound unsure, and it diminishes us in some way. So again, have someone listen to your usage and clue you in or help you understand if you are a person who has a tendency. I do find that it's a little more common with women. Um, I don't want to be sexist. However, women have a tendency to use those minimizer words more often. So ladies, listen up, become aware, and weed those minimizer terms out of your language. They're not helpful. They really do not uh, let you shine to the degree that you should. So those are all the tips I have for you this evening. I really appreciate your attention. I'd like to ask you the question, what's your next step? Are there some things that I've mentioned this evening that you know you need to work on or you think maybe you need to work on? Take it up with a friend, video record yourself, or you can also get in touch with me. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching with people. I do some small group, small group programs. I will customize a program for any group on either content creation or delivery. And I do love to speak. So if you know another organization that needs a speaker on communication-related topics, get in touch. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure, and thank you for having me.